Anger burns over a downed aircraft and a government which initially denied what happened. Iran now admits its missiles mistakenly shot down a passenger plane, but their apology hasn't stopped demands for those responsible to be held to account. I'm Maria Ramos and today's newsmaker is Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752. Just minutes after taking off from Tehran International Airport en route to Kiev, a Boeing jet crashed, killing all 176 people on board. Iran initially suggested it was due to a mechanical failure. Days later, Tehran admitted the truth. Its military mistakenly fired surface-to-air missiles at the passenger plane, fearing an American attack. The Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif blamed it on human error and a, quote, crisis caused by U.S. adventurism. He was referring to America's assassination of Iran's top general, Qasem Soleimani. But Iranians are angry at what they see as their government's attempt to cover up the truth. Protesters are calling on the country's leadership to stand down. Here's how events unfolded. ما علت بغستانه هنوز برای ما نمیتونه مشخص بشه ولی همچی اشاره کردیم قطعا موشکی به اون برخورد نشده rest until there are answers we will not rest until there is justice and accountability Joining me now is Saadeh Zibakalam. He's a professor of Iranian studies at Tehran University. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Uh, my first question to you is, why didn't Iran apologize immediately? Did it think that it could get away with it? Bismillah rahman rahim Well, um, first of all, um, um, we still don't know what exactly happened and uh, how far uh, Iranians uh, uh, officials knew exactly what had happened because it appears that only the Revolutionary Guard knew what had happened uh, shortly after the plane came down. But the rest of the Iranian government including Mohammad Javad Zarif, the foreign minister, Mr. Rouhani, the, the president, they really didn't know exactly what had been happening because uh, the, the head of uh, Iranian Civil Aviation Authority insisted uh, categorically that it was a technical failure. Now, that has made many Iranians angry because they believe that uh, given the fact that the Revolutionary Guard knew what had happened, why did they uh, keep it for, for about 72 hours from, uh, from uh, Iranian officials, 
from, uh, from the world, from Iranian, etc., etc. So part of the anger is, uh, is really, why did you hide it from the people? Okay, I think that could be something that many uh, would find it hard to, uh, to believe. But I, I want to ask, how does the government see a way out of the anger now in Iran? People are protesting. Um, the government has apologized, um, but is this enough? Well, um, even so, uh, yesterday, for example, the head of the uh, Revolutionary Guard came to the Iranian parliament and he spoke more than half an hour. And whilst he admitted that uh, they had made a mistake uh, shooting down the plane, nevertheless, he was trying to blame the United States for causing um, the underlying reason uh, for the for the disaster. And Sade, let me interrupt you here. The United States has is, come uh, to the area. Is, is the in U.S. The to blame? East. Is the U.S. to blame here? Because we saw that tweet from uh, from your foreign minister. Well, this is, uh, um, if you are asking, if you are asking uh, my opinion, I don't think it has uh, anything to do with the United States. But the point what I'm trying to, to, to raise is that um, uh, the Iranian foreign minister, head of the Revolutionary Guard, they are indirectly blaming the United States because they are saying that the, the U.S. Um, the, uh, uh, um, presence in the area has brought um, the lack of uh, security, insecurity, instability in, in the region. That's okay. why they are, they are partly blaming the United States for uh, actually uh, shooting down the plane. And then just very quickly, we've got 20, uh, 20 seconds left. Why was your airspace still open during such a sensitive time? Well, this is the questions that many Iranians are asking, that uh, why, the, why, the, why the space was open, should it not have been closed? Why did the Revolutionary Guard did not decide to uh, open the Civil Aviation Authority? Uh, Sadeh, I'm with afraid them, we've run out of time. So there are some, some many, fundamental questions, many questions that still haven't been answered. Indeed, Sadeh, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for speaking to us on the Newsmakers. Now, presidential elections in Taiwan have sent a clear signal to Beijing about the future of ties between Taipei and the mainland. And it's not a message China will receive warmly. Incumbent President Tsai Ing-wen uh, defended her pro-Beijing, uh, defeated her, her pro-Beijing rival in a record landslide, with voters endorsing her stance on Taiwan's autonomy. The question now is, what will China do about it, and how big a role did Hong Kong's protests, uh, protests play in the win? Natalie Pohonen reports. A resounding political victory in Taiwan has delivered President Tsai Ing-wen another term in office and a message for China. Tsai has secured about two million more votes than her nearest rival, Han Kuo-yu, from the China-friendly Kuomintang Party, or KMT. Her independence-leaning Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, has also held its majority in the legislature. It marks an incredible turnaround for Tsai, who had lagged behind Han in the polls. But then anti-government protests erupted in Hong Kong, and Beijing's response to the civil unrest there became a critical election issue. Tsai has vowed that as long as she's president, Taiwan will never be under China's control, a pledge she delivered again on the eve of the election. China considers Taiwan as part of its territory, and Beijing says this election outcome doesn't change that policy. Since Tsai first took office in 2016, the island has found itself under increasing political pressure from China. 
it's becoming isolated, with nations switching allegiance from Taipei to Beijing. Just 15 countries recognize Taiwan. Tsai says she wants to maintain the status quo with China and has called on Beijing to drop threats of using force to take back the island. For its part, the Chinese leadership sees unification as inevitable. The need for Taiwan to maintain a delicate political balancing act remains as essential as ever. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. OK, let's now unpack this election result. And to discuss this, I'm joined from Washington, D.C. by Melissa Newcomb. She's a project manager at the National Bureau of Asian Research. And in Beijing, we have China Affairs analyst Xu King Duo. Thank you both for joining us. And I want to go to you first, uh, Xu. This wasn't the result that China wanted. Um, what message does this send to Beijing? Well, I think it's really about Taiwan. It's about Taiwan's future. It's about the Taiwan people's welfare. Uh, if you say what kind of a message sent to Beijing, you would say every election, more or less, is about the relationship with Beijing. So in that sense, there's no special uh, message sent to Beijing. Uh, remember, uh, people would say the DPP, uh, Tsai Ing-wei, uh, won a landslide victory. That would be a strong message to Beijing. But also remember the opposition party candidate, Han Guoyu, uh, he also said, you know, uh, one country, two system, there's no way for that. Uh, if Taiwan is going to uh, realize that, that will be over my dead body. So basically, the two candidates, they share the similar message, if there's a message for but, Beijing. Um, so Otherwise, I would say, um, you can say it's, it's becoming political. It's Xu, more becoming political I just want to in clarify terms of something. Choice, in terms um, of people's choice of... Xu, you say there is no special message to Beijing, but she won overwhelmingly and the 8 million votes. I think in the way that, uh, in the way of, um, you know, DPP winning the election, you can see the role played by the situation in Hong Kong and also the negative coverage of China in terms of Xinjiang and other affairs. So I think uh, Tsai Ing-wen successfully instilled uh, this kind of a fear of China or uh, successfully persuaded the voters, uh, you have to vote for me, otherwise uh, you would suffer this and that. I think that's uh, engineering and election uh, or campaign skills uh, has been very successful for the DPP. All right, we'll go to Melissa. Melissa, what message do you think uh, this election has sent uh, to China? Mm. Generally speaking, I don't like to say, oh, elections in Taiwan have to do specifically only with China. But in this particular election, I do think there was a strong message to China, not just from Tsai Ing-wen in her acceptance speech, which she dedicates a third of it to laying out to Beijing how she wants to proceed with relations with the PRC. Um, but also from the Taiwanese people, rejecting the one country, two systems framework. The Hong Kong elections have been going on for eight months, and it really uh, awoke a generation of young voters to the reality that closer ties with China are very dangerous, and they see their peers not far away in Hong Kong, which is supposed to be democratic for at least 50 years. We're 23 years after the handover from Britain, and the one country, two systems framework is completely falling apart. Young people in Taiwan and a lot of other generations, but um, specifically the young people who came out to vote for Tsai Ing-wen, they reject that framework. So and I think it's a very strong message in this particular election. If you look at uh, Han Guoyu's uh, campaign, I would say it's a simply a poor campaigning from the opposition party. Uh, one example would be, you know, Han Guoyu won this election in the southern uh, Taiwan city, Kaohsiung, uh, with a large margin of 150,000 uh, votes. Uh, that's um, about one year ago. And uh, less than six months, uh, he became uh, the candidate of the KMT to run against Tsai Ing-wen. And people are disappointed about his uh, choice. And you could see uh, his support even in his own city. Now time, this time, he lost it about 150,000 votes. 
Okay. Exactly. Not because of his stance, not because of his relationship with the mainland, simply because I think he has run a poor campaigning. Uh, so sure. that's why I would say uh, partly Tsai Ing-wen won this election. I want you to respond to what Melissa said, that the one country, two systems uh, is falling apart. Would you agree? A uh, good point here. Of course, you know, when it comes to the Hong Kong, people also talk about, you know, one country, two system. Uh, is it not working or is this functioning poorly? I think this uh, principle uh, is still the best choice for Hong Kong and the mainland. Of course, that does not mean there will be no problem. There will be no difficulties in its implementation as time goes on. Probably they need some also reforms, some clarification in order to for further implementation of such a principle. But you can imagine, let's say, oh, let's abandon this principle. What else can we follow? Can we follow one country, one system? I would say Hong Kong people probably would find it even more difficult for them to follow. So I think still it's really about the mainland and Hong Kong uh, working together to uh, work out uh, uh, more like more content and also more clear lines on how to go forward from, uh, from this point now. Okay, um, Melissa, a question to you. Um, how much of uh, Tsai Wing's uh, victory was attributed to the unrest that we have seen in Hong Kong on those streets since last June? It's hard to put a definite number. I would say a large part of her success in this election was due to the unrest in Hong Kong. Previously, uh, during her first term, she passed a great deal of uh, acts in, in the legislative yuan that were not popular among Taiwanese uh, population, uh, things like pension reforms, labor reforms, things that maybe people saw money leaving their paychecks or they're not saving as much and they were unhappy with her. And you saw in the midterm elections a lot of KMT candidates winning seats, such as Han Guoyu, because at the local level, people weren't unhappy. But then when you think about the national level, I think Taiwanese voters are quite savvy and they are quite aware that cross-strait relations not only impacts their uh, everyday well-being, but their entire uh, kind of autonomous integrity. Um, and so I, you can kind of see in the polls, polls um, over the last year, as the Hong Kong protests dragged on, uh, Tsai Ing-wen's uh, popularity rose. Because people saw that actually what we need at the national level is someone who's strong and who will protect Taiwan's democracy and not uh, encourage uh, closer cross-strait relations at a time where clearly the PRC okay. is pursuing uh, measures against democracy. Melissa, we're running out of time, but my last question, question to you, Shu, sure. is um, what a lot of people are asking, what uh, will China do next? I think for China, it's very clear uh, from the uh, statement issued from the central government uh, that is, uh, you know, the principle remains unchanged, that is the peaceful reunification of the whole country, uh, meaning territorial integrity, and also the one country, two systems. Of course, when this principle comes to Taiwan, I think it's really up to the two sides uh, to talk about, to negotiate about a solution if there's a time in the future. And also the bottom line for Beijing is really about uh, to be against the Taiwan independence. Uh, as I don't think uh, Tsai Ing-wen would be, uh, say, to make that choice to uh, initiate a referendum or declare independence of Taiwan. Uh, if that is the case, we would uh, be going to see a worse scenario. Uh, there would be a lot of instability, upheavals, or even military conflicts. I don't think Taiwan can afford to uh, that okay. situation. It would be also hurtful uh, for China and the United States. We've run out of time. Uh, Shu and Melissa, thank you very much indeed. It, it's a fascinating uh, debate. Uh, thanks so much for your company here on uh, The Newsmakers. Thank you. Now, while there are no exact figures of just how many people have been kidnapped by the Taliban, the numbers are likely in the tens of thousands. Dilip Joseph was one of them. Uh, the American doctor and two of his Afghan colleagues were abducted in 2012, beginning a four-day ordeal that would end with his eventual rescue by U.S. Navy SEALs. He spoke with my colleague Adnan Nawaz about his experience and how he found common ground with people he believed would think little of killing him. 
Well, when something like that happens, you figure um, that's pretty much the end of your life. Um, you're not necessarily thinking about ways of um, a situation like that, you know, getting any better or you're getting out of that um, hostage situation. But it's only a few hours into the whole situation, I realized this could turn into a hostage situation than, than what is more common, which is um, just, um, you know, roadside robbery where they just loot you for what you have and kill you and move on to the next target. And in terms of communicating with your captors, was it a matter of uh, keeping quiet because you didn't want to speak out of turn, or did you feel ever comfortable enough to actually start any sort of conversation rather than just responding to commands? Um, in the beginning, it was just responding to commands. Um, and my medical colleague was there who was able to translate between English and the local Pashto uh, language that they were speaking. Um, so in the beginning, I just kind of uh, answered any questions that they had directly for me. But then as the time went on, um, I got a bit more comfortable in, in having conversations with them. And did you ever get the impression that they actually they saw you as some sort of representative of uh, their enemy, the United States, or they un realized immediately that you were doing work for the benefit of Afghans? That switch from realizing that I might actually be there to help them might have taken a while. In the beginning, it's always whatever category that they want to put you in, right? And, and the biggest category, category, as you said, is just seeing me as an outsider, and once you're an outsider, um, you're no good, you're, you're their enemy. And what did they talk to you about? Did they ever talk about the political situation, the military fight that they're involved in? Did they ever try to justify the, their reasons uh, for taking the fight to the Afghan government and NATO troops? Uh, it was not, um, although there were, there were conversations like that, it was not, um, it didn't come across like it was scripted or uh, directed in that sense. Um, but, but many of those um, innuendos or, or uh, opinions uh, kind of came to surface as we were talking about different things about life and culture, uh, religion, faith, uh, you know, many, many mundane matters of the day. And from your point of view, did you ever feel at all comfortable to try to explain why foreign troops were in their country? Because even talking about that could get you into trouble, I presume, because it's completely contradictory to their philosophy, of course. Yeah, I think it's interesting that in, in this situation, you know, I've been in situations where I've talked to many tribal leaders, uh, been to rural communities, and have these sort of conversations about culture and, and uh, as Americans, what we're doing in Afghanistan. But incidentally, in this, this situation, that didn't even uh, come up. It was almost like they were pretty much telling us, or, or me uh, mainly, um, what are you guys doing here, and, and uh, what do you think that you can make us better by having your military here? Uh, so it was never a conversation. It was just like, this is what we think. Uh, we think that what you, what you guys are doing is wrong, and we're not here to hurt you, but you're here to hurt us, that type of stuff. So it was very evident um, uh, what their belief or their ideas was about American military and the NATO in general. When you returned to the United States, I presume people were completely intrigued by your situation that you had been held for almost a week by uh, a group that is portrayed in the West almost as being animals. And yet you had lived with them and seen that they're actually, I presume, like so many other people in the world, they just have one particular cause that is different to other people's causes. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, y your your portrayal of, of that intrigue is definitely true. And in my case, I think it was heightened uh, also due to the death of a Navy SEAL that was shot uh, in my rescue. And that kind of put the story out there a little bit more than it would have. Um, as you can imagine, there, uh, there are a handful of these sort of hostage situations that happen um, on maybe every few years, um, and it certainly happens much more to the locals than it happens to the expats. So they're, they're definitely um, gave me a sense of an inside look at what these guys are about and how they work and how intricate their network is and 
um, you know, how they go on uh, in this cycle of violence that they're just gotten so used to over the last few decades now. How long did the entire rescue operation last? Were you able to get a handle on the duration of it? Because quite often in that kind of situation, sometimes people say as if time passes in slow motion. Yeah, it was definitely not going in slow motion for me. Um, uh, it definitely was, was a very uh, sort of uh, heightened situation when the, when the troops arrived and, and perhaps the entire rescue itself probably didn't take more than a couple of minutes, uh, although the uh, you know, f from their perspective, um, from the military perspective, it was probably a 24-hour uh, routine rescue operation where they had to do a lot of intelligence and, um, you know, get me back to a safe base. Uh, but the, the rescue itself, where I was taken from, uh, where I was being held in the room, uh, to getting me out of the room was probably less than a couple of minutes. Has it in any way, uh, in a rather strange fashion perhaps, made you feel even closer to Afghanistan and the trouble that that country has been going through for so long now? Yeah, I think I feel that way mainly because of the interactions that I've had in the country. You know, uh, at that time of my um, hostage situation, I'd already been traveling in and out of the country for four years, as you said before, 10 trips to the country, made a lot of friends, um, traveled to about 10 different provinces out of the 34 to total, seen a lot of the country. And because of those deeper interactions, and even, even due to some of the conversations that I've had with these, um, you know, insurgency factions, so it was just not, not just Taliban, there were Al-Qaeda. Um, at that time, ISIS hadn't uh, shown much of a presence back in 2012, although now it's pretty big uh, presence in Afghanistan. There were some Haqqani guys uh, in, the, in the group. I, I sort of feel that um, there's more to the story than, than and what we uh, tend to hear, just from the superficial nature of uh, bad guys fighting the good guys. You know, um, for some of these guys, it's it's their life mission, and uh, they drive it also from a point of religious intolerance and and um, uh, their faith-based um, uh, thinking, if you will, and the uh, way they've just um, the only way they've known how to fight against something that they don't believe in.